Okay, good day to you. I hope you're keeping well. Um, in this video, I'm going to explore um, this extract from book one of the prelude. You'll possibly be wondering why it's handwritten. That's because, let me just get my iPad, that's because this boy here um, did rip up my last copy of it, my last printed copy. So I've handwritten this and I'm hoping that these annotations go well because this is my only take at these. Um, but basically, this is the poet Wordsworth recollecting what happened to him when he was a child, when he stole a boat and rowed out into the middle of a lake, um, got scared by a distant mountain peak, rowed back to the shore, and then was left with a very troubled sense of how powerful nature is. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this um, first sentence or so and just dive straight into annotating um so one summer evening it explains or he explains led by her i found a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cove its usual home i forgot to put the full stop there um and i think it's important first of all to recognize that one summer evening led by her does personify mother nature here um, and it's actually a very active thing nature is something that can lead the poet upon his journey so I'm just going to write that down here that I wonder if I can zoom in a little bit more for you yeah that's good um, so nature is personified as a as a leader of the poet's journey. Um, and this is important because it does show that when you think about nature, you might think of it as a passive thing, as something that's just there that we experience, but actually it's not. It's an active thing. It's an active force upon humans. So this is significant. Nature isn't passive, rather it's an active force upon humans. Important point. Um, and when we look at this little boat, um, one summer evening led by her, by nature, I found a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cove, its usual home. And when you think about a boat, it does help us as humans surmount something natural like a river, a lake or the sea. Um, and so it's, uh, it's an unnatural object, in fact, that we have contrived. But still here, it's belittled, it's made small and it's still controlled. By nature. Nature will take it away if it's not tied. Nature is also what anchors it to the bank here, is the willow tree. So I do feel the need to pick up a black pen here um, and um, an irresistible urge has overcome me just to draw a boat. Um, a bit of a rubbishy boat it turns out. However, there it is. Um, and it has an oar over one side and an oar over the other and make sure that it looks like it's at least on water of some kind. Um, so there's my little rowing boat and it is significantly tied to a willow tree. So it is a natural object that is holding this in place. Um, so Willow trees never look like that. In fact, willow trees are more likely to do this because they frond themselves into the water. However, significantly, it is tied to a willow tree. Now, my annotations aren't all going to be pictures here, but I will um, explain what I mean here, that a man-made object is belittled it is made small with the word little there and also um, and held fast 
by a natural object that actually here nature already has power over humans in a sense very early on in the poem um i've actually used my drawing pen and i should have used my green pen but never mind um so just uh reading down from this um straight i unloosed her chain and stepping in this means unhesitatingly i untied her and stepped right in i pushed from the shore um it was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure and i'm going to just highlight this point here this troubled pleasure i think it's really quite important and i will return to this at the end of these annotations because really that um troubled pleasure is a neat two-word summary of the poem um and we'll return to that at the end as i say but let's just first of all explain that this is oxymoronic what that means is it almost seems a contradiction in terms that pleasure um isn't usually associated with trouble and trouble usually is something never experienced with pleasure but you know it is a troubled pleasure to him so this is an oxymoronic acknowledgement um, that the pleasure of of a nighttime row um, is lessened is lessened by the stealth and by crime because he's had to nick this boat um, but I will return to this at the end this trouble pleasure this oxymoron is actually something that is significant at the end especially um, it's almost foreshadowing Anyway, nor without the voice of mounting echoes did my boat move on says the poet um, leaving behind her on either side small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light and these are interesting verb choices here the um, the melted and the glittering these remind us i think of how um how nature again is an active force that these um let me just write this clearly that these verbs glittering and melting um, or melted they early on begin to develop the idea that will be built upon later on that nature and you'll notice that i'm using a capital n for nature throughout that's because it's a proper noun wordsworth means it is a proper noun i mean it is a proper noun it's something like a name for something bigger than the natural world um that nature has its own force Um, that it's not passive, it's active, it's alive. It's not passive, it's active. And alive, exclamation mark. Um, and those reflections melted all into one track of sparkling light. But now, like when i was copying this down i clearly didn't remember that like has an e on the end of it like one who rose proud of his skill to reach a chosen point with an unswerving line i fixed my view upon the summit of a craggy ridge the horizon's utmost boundary far above was nothing but the stars and the gray sky um i'm just going to again just escape into a little bit of um drawing here just to make sure that it's easily understood exactly what is going on here um, because it is imperative that you understand how the perspective of the boy um, affects the understanding of 
the poem. So I'm going to draw a craggy ridge here. This is, believe it or not, just a little craggy ridge, a craggy steep, he later goes on to say. And um, if you ever go or have you have ever been to the Lake District, you will know the sheer majesty of the landscape and how such um, heights of the lakes just seem to be inaccessible. I mean, you know, it's obviously worth running and walking up these mountains, but you can hear my dog barking there. It's rather annoying. Um, and usually these lakes that we row out into uh, are surrounded by trees. This are these are trees. I'm just drawing some quick trees here. And then the margin of the lake, very awkwardly drawn in. And to make it clear that this is water, I'm just going to draw some lines here to show that this is a lake. And if you could, um, well, perhaps actually I could just right here, Craggy Ridge. That is the Craggy Ridge right there. Um, and I could maybe put down here just where Wordsworth stole the boat from, known in the poem as a rocky cove. There is a little arrow to the rocky cove where he stole the boat from. And looking at, I imagine now, a little Wordsworth. There's a rowing boat, believe it or not, if I can zoom in even more, that there is a rowing boat. And in it, I've got a little Wordsworth. And this is near the beginning of the poem. So a little arrow there. And I will write Wordsworth at the beginning of the poem um, and he is rowing proud of his skill so rowing proud of his skill um, so there he is tiny weeny little words worth and looking up from his point of view I'm going to use a red pen to show the extent of his vision there the top of his line of vision in the red pen there is the craggy ridge, the craggy steep. And beyond that is nothing but, um, let's have a look, nothing but the stars and the grey sky. So I'm going to write here in red that above the craggy ridge he could see nothing but the stars and the grey sky. So that's all he could see at that point. And I'm skipping ahead a little bit, and I think it's worth doing it, that Wordsworth ended up rowing out further um, into the lake. These little arrows demonstrate him rowing further on. He's having a great time, Wordsworth, rowing out. And there, maybe, he's approaching his chosen point, and I put a Wordsworth there now. Now he's gone a little bit further on, so I put a little arrow there. And I'll write here that Wordsworth um, at the middle of the poem. So here is the point at which you can see the, um, the craggy steep and you can see beyond it and you can see the huge peak, black and huge. So I am skipping ahead a little bit, but... Actually, it's important that perhaps I just put these um, these extra little bits of the landscape that he didn't see before. So here, I'm going to put an arrow to that bit there. I think that it's important to point out that this is a I'll scroll that out. I don't know why I wrote that. A huge peak. Black and huge. 
Um, and the reason that it appeared to rise up from Wordsworth's point of view is because from over here, you could see, I'm drawing his line of vision, he could see beyond the craggy ridge, and now he can see the craggy, um, the peak black and huge. And so from Wordsworth's point of view, right here, in the, um, in the other side of the lake later on in the poem, he now can see this peak. And the further out he goes, the more this peak seems to rise up above him from his point of view. Um, and it would tower up above him. So I just wanted to make this clear, really, that, that this whole point, um, you know, that it's not just some kind of growing mountain um, like some animation, that it really does appear to rise up just simply because of his perspective there. So I'm going to zoom out and we're going to dive back into the language here. Um, so he is, as he says, proud of his skill. I'm going to put a little box around that because I've drawn a picture one side. I'm going to, have to annotate on the other side. So I'll draw a little arrow there. Um, this proud of his skill, this somehow, um, I guess, elevates his his power, or actually human power, to conquer and surmount nature. Um, this natural obstacle, the lake, it is um, something that he uses a man-made boat to row across. So he is proud of this. This pride is possibly one of his problems. So I'm just trying to make sense of that. I think elevates is the important word here. Um, that this elevates human power to conquer um, nature. Um, and that to surmount this lake, to surmount the lake, this natural obstacle, um, the poet has pride on, poet has pride on his side. He really does. He's okay. He's proud of his skill to just reach his chosen point. Um, and with unswerving line, he fixes his view upon the summit of a craggy ridge, the horizon's utmost boundary at that point, you remember from the picture. Um, far above nothing but the stars and the grey sky, she was an elfin pinnace. Um, again, I can hear you laughing, but this just emphasises, I'm just going to actually just annotate that off to this side here, um, that the adjective elfin um, highlights how small, and I'm going to put in brackets, fragile the poet is, and by the poet I mean the boy Wordsworth here. Um, so she was an elfin pinnace, lustily I dipped my oars into the silent lake. This adverb lustily I think actually adds to that previous point up here that um, that it betrays his um, his sense of his own strength his own vigor that he's equal to nature um, so it adds to his pride so let's just add on to this point that, that to surmount the lake the poet has pride on his side and this is reinforced with the adverb it is reinforced with the adverb um, lustily and I'm just going to write down something like this it betrays um, let's think what does it betray it betrays Wordsworth's sense of his own strength 
his own vigour and strength to e equal nature. So, you know, like he's proud of his skill. He can get across this lake. It's only a natural thing. He's in his man-made boat and he's got this man-made skill and he's proud of it. And also he can dip his oars into the silent lake lustily. That means that he has got his own vigour, his own strength, perhaps rivaling that of the natural obstacle in front of him. Um, I dipped my oars into the silent lake and as I rose upon the stroke my boat went heaving through the water like a swan and actually we're just building up his own sense of I don't want to say arrogance or self-importance because I really love Wordsworth however we do have this sense that he um, believes that he's more graceful and natural than he really is with that simple of um, a swan-like boat. So let's just um, make this clear. Let's make it make sense that this swan simile, I think it further betrays um, the sense of being equal, the sense of being equal to nature that yes swans are natural but so is my boat he seems to suggest that this simile forces readers it does it is the poet's way of forcing readers to reimagine I'm writing across terribly creased paper here, um, forces the readers to reimagine the boat as more natural as more natural and graceful. I think swans are known for grace. But this is a boat <laughs> graceful than it really is um, is interesting but actually looking at the language used here um, this verb heaving that my boat went heaving through the water and you have this long syllable in heaving this um, assonant heaving it actually speaks quite a lot about the effort that this boat has to go through it's a bit awkward perhaps the idea of heaving um, so i'm just going to say that perhaps that betrays more of a sense of truth um, that the verb the verb heaving um, perhaps reveals um, more truth of awkward um, awkward movement needing great force and effort um, so perhaps actually Wordsworth you know you you're proud of your skill to overcome this natural obstacle with your man-made boat and you have the strength equal to nature to lustily dip your oars in and your boat might well be like a swan graceful and natural on the water however heaving does give away a little bit of your up and down movement and your lack of efficiency perhaps um you know that maybe reveals a little bit more truth and then we come to this point here where he does actually see something significant um and that we have the horizon um a huge peak black and huge and this is lacking the poem's usual expressiveness this is a sign of nature's power transcending human com comprehension here um as if with voluntary power instinct upreared its head um so as if with voluntary power extinct instinct sorry 
sort of extinct. Um, perhaps too many glasses of wine at this time in the afternoon. Um, so as if with voluntary power, this is a simile and it forces this idea that the nature has a conscience somehow, that it decides to use its power. Let's just write that down here, that this simile forces readers to evoke ideas that nature has a has a conscience that it decides to use its power it decides to use its power as if with voluntary power instinct um, it upreared its head and here we have like um, an example of personification because really this um, this mountain does not have a head this is personification I'll write that down here before I lose hold of the word um, so this personification depicting Nature is somehow monstrous, I think. Nature as as monstrous. It has a head, and it's a scary one at that. Um, so we've got sort of two examples of imagery here: this simile and this personification, um, forcing us as readers to think of nature as um, conscious and deciding to use its power, and also as something that's monstrous and therefore scary with its power so uh, you know like from both of these ideas we can come up with that's a bit of a rubbish arrow we can come up with this idea that the power of nature is obviously potent that means powerful and it's threatening um, and also, and it diminishes. That means makes ever so small human concerns. Like Wordsworth trying to get to his chosen point, for example. Um, it diminishes human concerns into meaningless Triviality. That is, Wordsworth, I don't really care whether you're going to get to your chosen point or not. This is nature speaking, and you must listen. Um, and listen, he does. I'm sort of skipping up to the next part of the poem here. And growing still in stature, the grim shape, this is mountain still we're talking about here, towered up between me and the stars. Um, there's actually a comma there. And still, for so it seemed, with a purpose of its own and measured motion like a living thing. Um, actually, we can just look at that simile there, like a living thing. Um, I think we've already covered this point, actually. I'm going to put a star there. That describing this mountain like a living thing, I'm going to come back over here and say that actually this refers to this so actually these similes i'm adding the s there we've got two of them now these similes force readers to evoke ideas that nature has a conscience because up here we also say like a living thing um strode after me and so i think i think there's an important structural point to make here that that you have pretty measured stately and regular iambic pentameter throughout a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cove its usual home i'm straight i unloosed her chain and stepping in push from the shore it was an act of stealth this is very regular iambic pentameter as blank verse is and looking here and growing still in stature the grim shape towered up between me and the stars and still and so here we have um, a trochaic substitution, that is making a trochee where there would otherwise be an 
I am. Um, towered up. We emphasize the first syllable there towered up between me and the stars and still for so it seemed with purpose of its own we're back to the ambic pentametrics here and measured motion like a living thing strode after me and so those two syllables there strode after me and this is a spondy two stressed syllables the poet here uses um, two substitutions one trochaic and one spondaic to draw attention to the um, nature's huge size and menacing intent and the way that it chases after him. So I'm going to write or annotate that in as much sense as I can up here. So towered is a trochaic substitution. What I mean by that is that it substitutes an iamb, which is what we've used throughout the whole poem all the way through. It substitutes an iamb with a trochee, towered, emphasizing this first syllable and the second one unstressed, towered. And also um, we have strode, strode after, strode after, and so we have these stresses here. Uh, after is the two first syllables you can call a spondy, so that is a spondaic substitution. Um, and both of these, I think if I just put a little bracket there actually, um, so towered and strode after, um, these dis let me just try and make sense of this. These are disrupting. The, if you imagine the poet's heartbeat or the boy's heartbeat throughout, these are disrupting the the heartbeat. That is the iambic pentameter, um, the heartbeat regularity of. Iambic. Let me see if I can squeeze the word pentameter in there. Pentameter, um, which represents really um, I guess if you've got heartbeat representing the rhythm so far with the iambic pentameter, then when you substitute these iams with spondy spondies or trochees then you have palpitations really so these are fearful palpitations these are fearful palpitations that is something that's not in the normal rhythm of a heartbeat um, fearful pal palpitations from sensing um, nature's well towered huge size and strode after me so nature's huge size and strode after it, menacing intent so menacing intent um so that's that's a structural point but i think an important one um and growing still in stature the grim shape towered up between me and the stars and still for so it seemed with purpose of its own and measured motion like a living thing strode after me with trembling oars I turned this is a very revealing the um, adjective here with let me just get a little arrow for that with trembling oars I turned that this adjective trembling um, this adjective trembling clearly betrays the boy's fear and dread. So he's been scared. He's been so scared um, as he flees. As he flees as he decides to turn um, and I turned and through 
Through the silent water stole my way back to the covert of a willow tree. There in the morning, mooring place I left my bark. And so you have this sense of him leaving the boat there and that's it. He's done that physical part. The boat theft and the, um, the mountain witnessing is done. And through the meadows homeward went in grave and serious mood. But after I had seen and so on, this next part represents a summing up of the psychological after effects of the physical explanations that came before. So really we have, I'm just going to draw a dotted line there. Um, to represent this and we can call that um, a volta often used in sonnets a volta is a turning point in the poem where we have something um, let me zoom out something explained in detail before and then summarized in a different way often in a pithy and revealing way so let's just zoom back in and try to get that um, annotated suitably so this volta um, or turning point as it means so turning point you might well have thought the turning point came before when he saw the mountain but actually all of that is just the witnessing of a peak coming up when I wasn't expecting but this represents a division between physical and psychological so this volta or turning point um, I'm going to write here separating the physical um, event from the profound, because they were profound, psychological. That means in the head, in the mind. Um, so separating the physical event from the profound psychological after effects just like um i guess just like remains where you have this looter shooter and the physical action is described and then the psychological after effects this poem follows very much the same kind of structure that that he is unable to flush away this um this vision that um that remains in his mind um, and through the meadows, homeward went in grave and serious mood. But after I had seen that spectacle, I love that word, um, it makes it sound like nature put on this show for him deliberately. For many days, my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. This is the power and force of nature. Um, and it could not be flushed away as we think of it, um, that nature has a living and um, enduring presence in Wordsworth's mind. I think it's worth actually just highlighting that unknown modes of being right there and trying to explain that right here. If I can maybe zoom out a little bit, you can see it more clearly. Um, unknown modes of being, that the power and force of nature um, the power and force of nature could not be flushed. And I'm using remains language here, actually, that's fine. Could not be flushed away. Um, that nature left a living, nature left a living but albeit vague i think um and mysterious but vague presence in wordsworth's mind um and and you know this is a maturing of the poet's sensibilities here and and we come to um, an earlier point that we touched on about romanticism. Um, over my thoughts, that means over, remember, over my thoughts, there hung a darkness. Call it a solitude or blank desertion. Um, 
over my thoughts there hung and we think of thoughts as something um you know from the age of enlightenment and so this is a romantic reversal of enlightenment thinking i'm just going to point that out right here trying to make it clear so this is a reversal of enlightenment thinking and if you are wondering what i'm on about there you need to watch the previous video really um the reversal of enlightenment thinking and if when you think about it um, for the Enlightenment, thoughts were primary. Thoughts were um, over nature. Thoughts were something that we could use to deconstruct, dissect and understand nature. But here, Wordsworth reverses the whole thing. And the over thoughts, look at that preposition, over the thoughts, there hung a darkness, um, a solitude a desertion, a darkness, a solitude, a desertion. I'm going to write these words over thoughts to make it clear. So we have, I'm writing them in capitals, darkness, solitude, and desertion. These come over thoughts they are above thoughts look at them they take primacy over intellect which is a reversal and this is what wordsworth was trying to explain that actually nature itself cannot be understood or thought about properly and that they these things that symbolize nature are over thoughts themselves um no familiar shapes remained. No pleasant images of trees, of sea or sky. No colours of green fields. These are all very comforting things. Um, let me just get this in a little bracket there, if I can, and colour in a little arrow there. That This repetition of no kind of emphasises the lack of these comforting ideas of nature, these childish ideas here. So let's write that down. The repetition, almost anaphora, um, the repetition of no, emphasizes the lack of comforting um, childlike ideas of nature and and what's it replaced with um but huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men move slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams these previous ideals of nature are overthrown by this this nightmarish awareness of the unknowable power of nature so let's just try and show what replaced these childlike ideas of nature. Um, the previous ideas of nature are overthrown quite literally by a nightmarish awareness of nature's unknowable power so we have this real sense of um our previous conception or wordsworth's previous conception of nature somehow overthrown by this new more mature and darker vision of what it actually means and let me come back to this earlier phrase i mentioned before this this act of stealth that was a troubled pleasure and i want to return to that at the end here because he does actually mention that the word trouble and he mentions the word 
pleasant here and I think troubled pleasure is worth revisiting the 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 let me just write this down if I could try to get it down in this little space here um, if I write down trouble and pleasure to try and neatly bring all this together troubled pleasure that is the phrase from earlier in the poem that I said somehow distilled the whole meaning here um, well if you think of the pleasure as the craggy ridge that he saw it was familiar and knowable it was comforting so let me just make this clear here that this craggy ridge is the known um, comforting child childlike vision of nature and we have um, images of and then I think he lists um, well we have the trees um, let me look up what have we got um, the trees of sea of sky of fields these are all very comforting and these are all a pleasure and they are all represented in a sense by this craggy ridge this is me drawing these ideas on a craggy ridge this is a craggy ridge that I'm looking at this craggy ridge right here and the troubled part I'm going to draw behind it a peak black and huge this seem to rise up behind this seem to emerge once he had that voyage of discovery and this troubled is actually i would have written it belief troubled but i won't now because i've not got room um i'll write here the peak black and huge this represents the troubled part of the equation um, and this is the the unknown uncomfortable the unknown the uncomfortable um, majestic nature and that is characterized by those more vague words because they're beyond conception they transcend it words like forms like um darkness like um solitude words like desertion so this is what we have and actually if we could just um sort of personify a little bit this peak there we go it's personified now because we have some kind of craggy ridge with a face on it so i'm hoping that that makes some sense to you if your annotations look suitably similar let me just wear this off and um hopefully you can understand the language a little bit more now regarding the comparison ideas and the form and the structure more formally um, i will go through those in a later video but thank you very much for watching goodbye